my privilege to introduce our uh, first speaker of the day, uh, uh, Chris Ames, who is my partner at uh, UCSF. He really has been a, a leader and thought, you know, pioneer in the uh, field of uh, not just you know, um, deformity surgery itself, but you know, thinking about the spine as a whole and uh, in predictive analytics, big data, and AI. So Chris uh, will give us uh, his thoughts uh, for the next 20 minutes on this topic. All right, thanks uh, Lee and uh, for the, uh, the kind introduction. In the next uh, 20 minutes, I'm gonna update you guys on where we're going in, uh, in big data and predictive modeling for spinal deformity surgery. It's tough to give the first talk, and it's a data talk in Hawaii in the 7.30, so bear, bear with me. I'm gonna try to get through, <laughs> through all these slides, so I'm gonna go kind of fast, because I want you guys to know not only where we are, but also where we're, where we're going in the future. So a few months ago, one of my patients called me God's spine factory on Earth. And I'm starting to take some business uh, classes and combining this with big data. And I thought, you know, really what we're doing is we are manufacturing spines. And if we start to apply the science of manufacturing and process improvement to this, it may be interesting uh, for us in terms of analyzing how big data may take us forward. So there's, there's something in the Six Sigma process called DMAC, uh, which is define, measure, analyze, improve, and control. And this is, uh, the remainder of the lecture will really be trying to see how big data can help us to apply this to process improvement in spine manufacturing. So one of the aspects of this which is interesting is just, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> it's just the aspect of the ASD epidemic. We really have a rapidly aging population around the world and increasingly we're seeing that spinal deformity surgery can benefit a certain subset of those patients. It's very expensive. And much of what we do in big data now is going to be trying to figure out what subset of those patients will most benefit uh, from the application of this expensive manufacturing process. It's also interesting to realize that we're putting this up against, uh, in a competitive environment, uh, other procedures that are actually quite effective cardiovascular procedures, musculoskeletal procedures. Uh, these surgeons are actually making people a lot better at a much lower cost. And then we have dementia coming down the road at us with an aging population with an estimate of one trillion US dollars to be spent in dementia care. So as spine surgeons, when you know, 20, 30% of our patients are not getting better and we're spending $100,000, this is not a sustainable uh, environment in the future. So we need innovation. First, we have to define the problem in the environment in which we need that innovation. So let's look at our failure rates and just take them right in the face and see what we're dealing with. <clears throat> if we look at rod fracture rates, anywhere from 10 to 50 percent. The best study on rod fractures was Justin Smith's study, uh, ASLS, that we just, uh, I think it was just accepted for publication. Five-year follow-up, up to 40 percent rod fracture rates. PJK rates, 10 to 40 percent. Reoperation rates around 20%. And as spine surgeons, we're familiar with these, especially as spinal deformity surgeons. We say, okay, well, this is kind of what we're used to. This is not a big deal. Well, let's do this in a comparison, a price comparison. Imagine you're an administrator at NHS, Medicare, and you're starting to look at this procedure. When you compare it to other very complex operations, it is really still a disaster. And then we look at things like arthroplasty, where in the aging population, these orthopedic surgeons, these arthroplasty surgeons, are actually making patients much better. And we see that currently our failure rates are just not sustainable in a comparative, comparative environment. If we look specifically at the incremental cost effectiveness ratio modeled out to 10 years, it's still $80,000, and that's if the patient only has one operation. Interestingly, for pharmaceutical and chemotherapeutic interventions, those numbers are usually around $70,000 for governments to support this. If we reoperate on these patients, it absolutely just annihilates our cost effectiveness. So we have to do something different. UCS, I call this the UCSF special, so he always likes this, but this is what we're doing at UCSF. I mean, we are doing everything we can to prevent reoperation on these patients. I mean, double pelvis, double rods, ligament repair, two surgeons, plastic surgery. Most of these are not reimbursed, actually. These are expenses the hospital bears, that we bear, extra time, and we're not getting uh, reimbursed by this from uh, most of the payers. So what can we do as we analyze and we define the failure rates? What can we do to try to improve this process through data? One is better benchmarking, figure out, really compare like to like in terms of risk and outcome. Another is trying to eliminate human bias and human error. We're missing structural information. 
We have unmeasured biological variation. So if you think about, if you're using raw materials <clears throat> and you're pulling those raw materials out from a metal mine and there's unmeasured variation in the metal, of course, if you're building a structure, you're gonna have big problems with that, right? So we have to better measure a biological variation on these patients. And then we have to implement a, a huge loop uh, process, uh, loop ecosystem of process improvement that we all participate in. So I'll go through uh, each of those. First is comparative measurement error. It, this is an example from our, uh, our uh, ISSG data set where we initially, when we benchmarked PJF rates, we drew an average value across. So we're trying to say, okay, we're gonna improve PJF by saying who's an over or under performer. <clears throat> And I know Alex does a lot of this work, you know, with quality improvement. The problem was that we were comparing very different patients and very different procedures and drawing an average value across is just ridiculous. What you have to do is apply adequate predictive modeling, including the patients, the procedures, the deformities, the bone density, and then figure out who's an over or under performer. And businesses do this all the time, in much more sophisticated, in a much more sophisticated way, when you um, <clears throat> are landing on, on airplanes, they have predictive models that predict failure, for example, in the landing gears and how many times they've landed and all this. So we have to have more sophisticated ways of doing comparison. And one thing you notice from this is that the sites that initially looked good actually don't look so good anymore. They actually may have, some of them should have had lower rates of PJF. And some of the sites that looked awful, and one of those is our site, actually when you look at the, the type of patient they're treating, and the, the magnitude of the deformities that they're correcting, they actually look much better. So the first step in process improvement is an adequate and, 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 and more sophisticated analysis, more accurate analysis of uh, failure uh, in general. Another is that as humans, and when we're, when we're applying human judgment, we are significantly subject to, to human noise and, and bias in our, in our decision-making processes. Uh, those of you interested in, uh, in, in really a good analysis of this, there's an excellent book called Thinking in Bets um, by a, a female poker champion. And one of the, the errors that she, that she points out is something called resulting. And that is, resulting is when you, uh, you make a, a bet, you lose, and you draw the conclusion that that was a bad bet. So in poker, that's an error of logic. It may have been that that was absolutely the, the right decision to make at the right time. You should have made that, and you're just going to lose once in a while. Surgery is much more like poker than it is like chess. Chess is really completely controllable. Poker includes a lot of unknowns. So if we operate on someone and they do poorly, as humans, what do we do? We're like, oh, I shouldn't have done that procedure. But that's actually not correct. If you think about it really from a, from a logical surgeon decision-making process, it may have been that once in a while you made the right decision, but once in a while that patient still would have done poorly. So uh, we wanted to develop <clears throat> risk calculators that would better inform decision-making in complex procedures. And we started with the model of adult deformity surgery, and we combined our efforts with the European Spine Study Group. And one of the studies we did was comparing human to machine uh, prediction of risk and outcome. So if you look at some of the, the human uh, estimates of risk, you see they vary on an individual patient case by anywhere from zero to 100%. So literally one case went around and the surgeons are like, I think there's a zero chance of complication. And the other surgeon said, I think there's a 100% chance of complication in that patient. So you can see it's just, it's ridiculous, right? There's so much variation. And these are very experienced surgeons. These are the best surgeons, uh, certainly the busiest surgeons in the US and Europe uh, treating these patients. Well, how did the machine do? The machine was completely accurate. When we validated this at uh, UCSF, uh, actually the machine was right on. Um, and then we compare human to machine, well guess what, there's not much agreement. So humans will make different decisions, the same human will make different decisions on different days based upon mood, the, the past experience, they just saw a complication in clinic, it will, it will totally change what they're doing. The machines just look at the data and predict based on the data. So they're not subject as much to noise uh, and bias. Now let's look at some other things that the machines can do. One is the machines can completely change the way that we as surgeons look at patients. So on the left is, it, it is, is a uh, representation of how a sophisticated surgeon these days <clears throat> may look at a patient. So there's a good surgeon, they measure the frailty, they're up on the latest literature, they do disability scores, bone density, BMI, they do radiographic analysis, but it can't compare to the way the machines can look at patients. 
So on the right is how the machine would look at the patient. Places the patient immediately in the context of every other patient that's been treated and realize that this cloud of patients is ever growing. And that's gonna be one of the messages of the talk, is every month, every year, this cloud of patients grows. And they are clustered into similar patients based upon 50 to 100 to 150 different variables. And then around that patient, you draw a similar patient cloud. And you say, oh, how did those patients do? What complications did those patients have? And then you can do this. We can say, how were those patients treated in Hawaii? How were they treated in Bordeaux, France? How were they treated in Japan? How were they treated in San Francisco? A very similar patient matched radiographically, matched demographically, matched comorbidity-wise, and the future ma matched methylation and telomere-wise, matched activity-wise. We can match all these patients as we grow these clusters. And that's something humans can't do. We can't immediately pull out 10 similar patients from around the world that Ibrahim Obi treated or Ferran Police treated and compare what we were thinking to how they treated those patients. The other thing we can do is dramatically change how we predict complication. In the past, what did we do as surgeons? So if you were a good surgeon and you wanted to quote a patient a risk of the operation, you'd pull up a paper from one of the huge research groups, right, or maybe from your own group, and you'd say, well, this was our average complication risk for this procedure, right? Average value. What the, what the computers can do is say, this is you, demographically, radiographically, aging, genetic-wise, bone density-wise, et cetera. This is the procedure you're having in my hands at my institution, and this is exactly how we think you'll do with about an 80% accuracy rate, and increasing, hopefully, over time. At every time point from point zero, or essentially out to 48 hours, why is that important? That's important for resource utilization. Who has to go to the ICU? Who's gonna have an event in 48 hours versus not? Also out to two years. Humans who grew up trying to avoid like saber-toothed tigers in the, in the jungle, we're really good at predicting short-term risk, like the next hour, <laughs> the next, next 10 minutes. We're horrible at predicting risk at one to two to five years post-op. That's where the machines are much better. And then in my practice, I actually have the patient sign the informed consent from the uh, prediction from the computer-based prediction of their risk. Outcome's the same. And what, how did you tell your patients how they were gonna do with surgery? You look in the major papers, it has a certain improvement, and you quote that patient an average value. If you do that with outcome, though, you're lying to 95% of the patients. Because if you look overall at this cl cloud, this is how the pa every patient in the European and, and North American database did. It's all over the place. So if you just draw an average value, you're only representing 5% of the patients. You're essentially lying to 95% of the patients in terms of how they're gonna do. But we can actually now enter all the patient information and predict accurately how they're gonna do. So this is what it looks like. We cluster the patient, we can pull out similar patients, we enter a bunch of uh, demographic, radiographic, disability-related information. In the future, genetic information, activity information, spectroscopy information, force prediction information, and then we generate uh, graphs of how they're likely to do, and we can have them sign it. And it, uh, we can do this for every instrument across all the HRQOL domains. Well, let's take a, now we were in the weeds, let's take a step back. So what can this do at the level of like national healthcare systems? So if we compare the ability of the machine to predict quality gained in someone who's gonna reach MCID and we operate according to the machine versus operating according to what the surgeons recommended, we see the machines beat the surgeons by 684% in quality. Anyone that doesn't think machine learning is coming to decision making, this slide <laughs> I think <laughs> makes the point. At the level of populations where you have a limited amount of money to spend, we can do this now. We can say U.S. has still a lot of money to spend, so they can tolerate more complication, a little bit lower MCID. More limited economies that are already on uh, restrictions and, and budgeting, they're going to have to draw really high likelihood of MCID and lower risk of complications, which are costly. So this can be variable. Since we can predict, we can draw these filters for each major economy. And then we can say, in the US, if we apply a 50-50 filter using predictive modeling, we can reduce costs by $500 million, potentially. Well, this is invading all aspects of care. Uh, we're moving now from shallow medicine, which is based on correlation coefficients and average values, 
to deep medicine, and this represents all the FDA approvals in the software space, using machine learning in the last several years, and it's just rapidly growing. And I would say the, the U.S. FDA environment is actually very favorable now for shared decision-making tools. They've been very receptive to this uh, over the last several years. One of the areas where this is really interesting is now we, we were predicting risk and outcome. What else can the machines do? Well, this information has suddenly come to light. Uh, nothing like more data to show that some of your past paradigms are no longer quite as accurate. So now we have basically 1,000 patients in our database. We re-looked at the impact of SVA on, uh, on disability scores. Well, essentially, these, the value disappears. It's no more than 10% at most overall. Post-op, it's nearly gone. 5% of the variation in outcome is based on the sagittal plane. Think about that for a second. But it is uh, causing some risk of mechanical complication, right? We do want to avoid mechanical complications. So where does the machine come in? Well, it comes in through helping you to design uh, custom rods. Now all the companies are entering into the custom precision realignment space. It's not going to drive disability scores. We've shown that. But what it's probably going to drive is decrease in mechanical complication. And remember noise and bias? We showed surgeons cannot accurately bend rods. If you ask an experienced deformity surgeon to bend a rod to, a, to uh, 20, 40, 60 degrees, they're, they're off by 20 degrees. What does that mean? That means that, for example, a 16 degree rod bend error results in a nine centimeter SVA difference, if you, if you simulate that. Why is that? Well, that's just one aspect of it. First of all, they can't even bend the rod. And then they can't process all the details and, and information in calculating reciprocal changes. For pediatrics, they're trying to calculate it in the lumbar spine. For us, we're trying to calculate it in the thoracic spine usually. We're usually fusing patients to the pelvis. We're trying to predict how the pelvis is going to equilibrate. This is beyond the ability of humans to predict. What did we do in the past? We looked in papers that like Virginie Lafage published, and we said, okay, that, that's an average reciprocal, reciprocal change value of 13 degrees. But everyone's different, right? That was really inaccurate. So we now use machine learning to inform this. Again, this is part of a cloud where you have 5,000 patients that were operated on, the machines take the radiographic variables and they can predict how the patient's gonna to react to a given correction. And then the rods that we're using for these patients incorporate not just an accurate bend, so when the machine says 20 degrees, it's 20 degrees, but also can include all the data from 10,000 patients on calculating the reciprocal change when they bend that rod. So you can see it's quite, it's quite a bit more sophisticated and more accurate. The other aspect, and I'm not going to talk about this too much, but this is another really growing area where machine learning and, and prediction is coming to this, is just think about this for a second. This, to me, this is one of the elephants in the room. So as surgeons, what do we do? So as surgeons, we are architects, maybe, right, at best. We design a certain reconstruction, right? But any of you who ever renovated your house or, or built a house, you, you know it from the cost standpoint, right? You pay for an architect. Who else do you pay for? An engineer. Right? You're not going to build something, you're not going to build a bridge or a building without paying for an engineer to analyze that structurally. But guess what you can build without paying for an engineer? You can build spines all day. Now they'll fall down, <laughs> they'll break, right? So in the future, we're going to be predicting structural forces and, and then learning from those structural force predictions and making our rod bending and our constructs more accurate and more durable over time as we add this variable, this important variable of force prediction into our overall strategy to improve care. And now I'm gonna, this is the most exciting area, uh, and Lee was asking me like, what, what do I think is coming down the horizon? To me, the, most, the thing I get most excited about now is identifying new variables. I think new variables that, that impact prediction is kind of the most, most exciting area. So if we look at, and we take an honest look now that like our research group is analyzing every variable that we have in the database and we're doing all these predictive models, we're still only accounting for about 30% of the variation. So 70% of the variation in outcome, despite all of our, uh, our data that we're collecting, we're still not measuring. So is that a known unknown? Are we collecting it and just not looking at it? Or is it an unknown unknown? Things we haven't even thought of that might influence outcome. And now I'm gonna run through some of those. This unmeasured variation is a huge hot topic right now. Something we're starting to look at is metabolic profiling. You can model major surgery as a trauma, as a major trauma. Older patients, remember, don't respond as well to major trauma systemically. 
So this company, Metabolon, and, and our group are collaborating. They can do 500 metabolites pre and post op. So we're going to add these large metabolic profiles to our data and see what comes out of that in terms of how older patients may differentially respond to surgical stress. The other thing that we've done and, and uh, we presented and won the Hibbs Award for uh, last year at the SRS was differential aging. And we're starting to look at telomeres and telomere length. And actually, when we talk about risk, telomere length, which changes with age, but is variable for individuals, was the single most predictive variable of risk of major complication, even more than frailty, 26 times. And we all know this from clinic. We'll see 45-year-olds that look 80, <laughs> and then we'll see 80-year-olds that look very, you know, really good, look uh, better than we do sometimes. And this is this variability in aging is accounting for a lot of this uh, unmeasured variation. So in the future, in all the models that I showed you, they don't include this aging-related variation. The next generation of models uh, will include this. The other thing we're looking at is the biological basis of frailty. To this, we've turned to transcriptomics and methylation analysis. There's a company called True Diagnostic, which actually got its start. Uh, they're, they're in Kentucky. Anyone know why they would be in Kentucky? Racehorse performance. So they do methylation analysis to predict who's going to be a good you know, racehorse and, and do uh, you know, valuations for, uh, for breeding. Um, and we partnered with them. Uh, to do methylation analysis in, in our adult deformity population, combining this maybe with some other variables. And we found for the first time some correlation of methylation aging profiles to the biological basis of frailty. So we hope to develop an at-home test that can be used to predict surgical risk, combining blood test and methylation for aging with uh, other aspects and other demographic aspects uh, of, uh, of aging and, uh, and risk. Finally, it looks like the combination of genetic basis of aging, transcriptomics, metabolomics, um, and proteomics is actually much more accurate than any one individually. And the aging field, which is totally separate from ours, and those of you interested in, in, in research and creative research, I would really encourage you to stop reading so much in your own field and read in other uh, related fields, because it would just blow your mind how much other progress is being made outside of spine surgery. So it seems like these combined scores, these composite scores that include all the different aspects of array analysis are much more accurate in predicting risk of aging than, uh, than any individually. So this, I mentioned to you, I would give you a glimpse of the future. These clusters that we previously differentiated based on radiographic and demographic uh, analysis, now we're gonna include aspects of different aging clocks They'll include in the future uh, frailty estimates as well as uh, uh, these uh, composite scores of met metabolite and proteomic expression. Finally, uh, this is an area that we're currently working on is to transform uh, intraoperative neuromonitoring. So just take a step back and think about how ridiculous our current neuromonitoring technique is. So someone sits there and hits a button and stimulates the patient and then stares at it and says, oh, that represents a change. <laughs> to me, that's ridiculous. Because when you look at these, these recordings, this is something that the computers would do a much better job at averaging, especially when you include other variables and you normalize it to the blood pressure. And you can, you can look at which patients are blood pressure responsive versus or not. You can look at waveform height you know, and, and area under the curve. We can't do an immediate assessment real-time area under the curve analysis. Humans can't do that. So what we see is that neuromonitoring does a really good job for the spinal cord, but neuromonitoring does a horrific job for nerve root monitoring. So one of our residents, my current fellow, is starting to use machine learning uh, in a uh, lumbar osteotomy data set, and we've recently expanded our uh, collaboration to uh, Spain. And this is what he's been able to do using machine learning. So the current machine learning algorithms are twice as sensitive and, and much more specific than a human-based neuromonitoring uh, type of uh, detection of nerve root deficit. And so this will be invading every aspect of our care. And then finally, to touch on this, the control aspect of what we're doing. So right now, we have very siloed data sets, right? You have some intraoperative imaging, you have preoperative planning, you have execution, and then you have uh, uh, estimation of the accuracy of your execution, right? But they're, right now, they're not cross-talking to each other. So my research work 
and development work over the next decade is going to be really around trying to build this app environment where all these things like activity, genetics, frailty, they're going to come in and it's all going to be part of this loop feedback cloud. And we've also started collecting tissue, looking at histologic variation in bone, for example. And this will be used ongoing as the data cloud expands, as more and more data comes in from every aspect of the surgery, will rapidly scale and exponentially expand our data sets and allow not just like the research groups to participate in this, but every surgeon in every operating room will be able to enter their data and benefit from this cloud computing where every aspect is captured. And this aspect, the app environment aspect, you can tailor to your individual practice. I like to say this, uh, lost clinical data is a lost opportunity to improve care, but it's also a lost opportunity to train. We can't forget our roles as educators. What we'll see in the future is that the next generation will be much more facile in the interpretation and utilization of all this data to improve care than, than we were growing up in the age where we still had, we were still hanging x-rays. So thank you guys very much uh, for your attention and um, I really in, uh, look forward to the rest of the course. Hey Chris, do you mind staying up uh, just for a couple questions? Chris, thanks again for that talk. That was exceptional. Uh, I, you know, whenever I look at data and big data sets, one of the questions I typically have is outliers. So do you have stuff in the data sets that is so far out that it's not modeled in the data? Well, it, all, the, uh, all the patients are included. But what we do have in the, uh, in the predictive models is we do have an accuracy assessment. So if you enter a patient, like you enter someone 105 years old, in your practice and you tried to model a, a, a C2 to the pelvis in that patient, it would say uh, not able to model because there wouldn't be enough patients that are similar to that patient in the data set. So essentially we include every patient in the predictive models that we have from our data sets, but if there's not enough representation of that particular patient type, it will not model that patient. Also if it does model it, it'll give uh, an estimate of the accuracy. So it'll say high accuracy, middle accuracy, you know, low accuracy or not compute. So we, we built into it that safety aspect where, you know, it won't just look at one patient from the data set and just compare your patient to that one and say that that's your likely outcome yet. Yeah, that's right. So, uh, it's a great talk, Chris. Um, I know that you are really interested in the modeling and the AI and future improvements on decision making. So based on what I'm seeing is that you actually RPAs and nurse practitioners can enter the clinical data. So we are in the clinic mainly basically making the decisions. So the imaging technologies, image recognition can do all these measurements and enter the data. And seems like the surgeons are gonna be moving away from the decision making process. So where is this role of the surgeons in the future in this process? It's a really good point and it's, um, <clears throat> it's the next horizon. So if you, t you look at the financial world, Initially, much of the work in the, in the financial world when you would you know, make investments was all around predictive modeling. But now that the models are very accurate, how do you take the surgeon and patient and build tools that allow them to digest all those various predictions? You can imagine, like you're talking to your investor, you're talking to your surgeon, you say, well, the risk of this is this and the outcome is this, the risk of you know, this and the outcome is this, and the patient's like, I don't, know, I don't know what to do, what do you think? So I think it's still the role of the surgeon to help the patient to interpret those models. And all of these are shared decision-making tools where it's very important for you to sit there with your patient with the most accurate information possible and, and on an iPad with, their, you know, with their, their realignment pictures and their estimates of their risk outcome, complications, neurological complications in the future and all this, reoperation and say, you know, this is what I think we should do, or these are your options. So it just makes the shared decision-making discussions more accurate. That's how I see it right now. Chris, terrific talk. As, the, as these models get better and better and more widely utilized, do you, um, do you have any concern that uh, payers will use this data against our ability to take care of patients, and how do we mitigate that going forward? Yeah, it's another really good point, Lionel, and, and you know, what, I would argue, yes, it's possible, but these are tools that are developed by surgeons, and the payers already have these models. So when you talk to the, 
uh, the foot and ankle, the retired foot and ankle surgeon who's, or the internist who's weighing in on your, whether you should do a, a spine surgery or not, they have those, they have models. The insurance company already has models of cost, risk, outcome, you know, your complications, your, they, they have all these models already. We just don't, we don't see them. So this at least arms us with our own ammunition, our, our, our own, uh, something we created with our patients. And you're right though, sometimes the model's gonna tell you something you don't wanna hear. You wanna hear that you're gonna be able to help that patient. The model may say that's unlikely, and then that's gonna be a different experience for us. And I also think if you, you, know, if you look to the, some of the chess analogies and some of the other AI, you know, there's a really good book by Kasparov about like, looking into the eye of the computer and learning like, how the AI thinks. And, and actually, the, I'll, just, I'll finish with this, but if you guys study the, the AI models in chess, what do you think the computers are most likely to do? If you're trying to identify a computer AI-based move in chess, you think it's gonna be a boring move or the most creative move? It's creative. The computers come up with crazy moves that like win. <laughs> <laughs> the humans have never thought of over the years. You think that they would just wear them down, right? Like a million moves and then they win? No, the computers come up with crazy moves. So I think actually that as we study sort of the, the mind of the computer in, in something that we're very familiar with, it may start to teach us a little bit. Like that, that patient that you didn't think would do well or that one that walked in and you thought, oh, that's a winner and the computer's like, oh, no way, you know? And it, I think there's going to be a process of going back and forth, like a chimeric organism where we're going to learn from it. Bobby? Uh, wonderful talk. And one of the things that I'm concerned about is as you increase the number of uh, data points, um, there's always going to be a cost associated with it, right? But yet, a failure of an operation is a tremendous amount of cost. Uh, and that that's going to have to be put into the equation when making, uh, making uh, kind of an appeal to the insurance companies that these tests that we do are in the long term of great benefit to healthcare. Do you, do you ever think uh, that's one thing and what are your thoughts about that and how to get things going with, from that standpoint? The yeah. other part of it is, is this going to be available to everybody uh, without cost, because I can imagine seeing lawyers and medical legal people looking at a failure of an operation, punching in these numbers, getting data you know, after the patient has had a problem, and then saying, well, your doctor didn't explain it to you appropriately, and this is a, you didn't, they didn't counsel you well about the risks, and therefore th your doctor is, in, is liable. So, um, when, and then it's created by surgeons, but it's not used against surgeons. So, any comments and thoughts? Yeah, it's, it's again, really good, you know, insightful points. I think this is where the registries will still be useful, and the individual institutions even more so, where we can still, at UCSF or at ISSG or, you know, the, the harms group, we can still test new variables. Uh, we can invest in met metabolomics, for example, and see whether metabolomics will really inform the, the risk of our patient. Maybe it's an expense we, you know, we don't need. Maybe it's outweighed by a lot of other things. Um, but w what I, I think in the future what you're going to see is that much of the data systems are going to become democratized, where it's going to be really not just the research groups that are able to, to participate in the big data improvement for patients. But this is going to happen, I think, probably through industry, where they have the greatest reach, maybe through the societies, you know, uh, but probably through industry where they're gonna give you tools. Um, they're gonna transform their business models from an implant model where you put something in a patient to software as a service models and data models where you're gonna have to pay s some amount for participation in that data cloud and benefiting from those predictive tools that are generated from that data cloud. And they're going through this right now. They're not exactly sure on the industry side how they can monetize data and software. We're going through this at UCSF where they don't want to pay extra for precision rods, right, that come with a data service attached to them. But the whole field for the betterment of patients has to go toward paying more for data 
and less for implants. And I think what we're going to see is a democratization of the data cloud with partnership with industry and societies. And the registries and individual large academic centers will pilot different data fields and try to figure out it's more expensive with industry and with grant funding to try to figure out which of these variables is going to be important and which may be not so important. Yeah. Serena. How many FTEs does it take for you, each surgeon, to enter the kind of data that you need to generate this kind of database? It basically takes a, a full-time FTE um, to, to do it, right? Because, and, and we use our, you know, our research coordinators to do it. Um, however, there are opportunities, again, likely through partnership with industries or societies, to make this much more streamlined. So the patients can enter all their demographic information online before they come in. The radiographic measurement can all be performed through industry services. I mean, and this is not just one company, by the way. All the companies are moving toward measurement services, you know, data services. And then the additional variables would be through partnerships with other individual companies. So, uh, you know, Medtronic, for example, is partnering with a methylation company. You know, and they'll, they'll add, they'll, it's probably going to be like an app environment, right? Well, you'll, a lot of it will be pre-measured and already entered when you see the patient in clinic. You'll have to enter the procedure. That's your job. And then the app environment will be like, okay, uh, maybe I want to do like the Miris uh, watch. Uh, fit, you know, I want to enter activity data. Maybe I want to do the methylation thing, and I'm going to add that into your app environment for the individual patient. And I think creating that app environment where the large companies don't have to spend all the money for each individual app that you might want to add to your patient is what's going to really allow this to explode. Um, so we're thinking of ways to try to offload a lot of that work. Right now, it is, it is difficult, but I think in partnerships with industries and also societies like the SRS, you can figure out ways to bring industry money in, grant money, and, and make this a more streamlined process. Great. Sorry to take so much time. Thanks, guys.